And also make sure, as everybody has a long day tomorrow, that maybe it's below two hours. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, no, I, Enjoy I, it. I was actually going to uh, start with just an announcement about uh, the time. I know that, you know, it's uh, whatever it is, past 9.30. Uh, I just want you to feel assured that where I come from, which is the west coast of North America, it's about lunch. So I am more than good to go for two or three hours. All right, just so that, uh, that you understand that. One other thing I should mention, uh, you'll see at the top left corner here, um, sponsored <coughs> by Agnico Eagle, um, at the risk of, um, of uh, offending the other companies, I want to tell you that if I offend any of you here, please don't, br don't blame Agnico Eagle. Okay, this is all, they have, they don't know what I'm going to say. So, there you are. Okay, well this is what we're going to talk about. Um, the, the last time I was before this group was uh, two years ago. And, uh, you know, there's certain topics that I kind of favor, and you'll see, obviously, that I like to talk a little bit about gold. I also like to talk a lot about the, uh, the U.S. dollar. Uh, I thought this year I would give you a little bit of a background on the global trade war. Okay, this has been coming for a long time. Okay, it's just, it, 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 it just, you know, sort of built to a crescendo under the election of, of Donald Trump. But if you read carefully what Hillary Clinton was saying during, the, during her campaigns, it was all there written out. The U.S. is fed up. Okay, and that's, we're going to talk a little bit about that. Also, because the equity market has been going through a little bit of a kerfuffle, I thought I'd just give you a little bit of a background as to how an economist like ourselves think about the equity markets. And we're actually fairly supportive of equities. Uh, we're, we're not particularly worried about this being the beginning of some great calamity. Uh, gold equities, I know that's a topic that is uh, high on the minds of everybody. Um, we look at that slightly differently, and I want to show you some charts on that and try to explain, um, you know, what our take is on why the gold equities have, quotes, underperformed relative to um, the gold price. Okay, so let's start um, with one of my favorite topics, the U.S. dollar. Okay, this is a chart that I think is pinned up in the Oval Office in the White House. Okay, this is the U.S. trade deficit. Okay, now I've split the deficit into two components. One is the petroleum balance and the other is the non-petroleum balance. And you can see that back in around 07, 08, the U.S. had a very, very large trade deficit. Uh, deficit that was running approximately 70 billion a month, so figured out about 850 billion a year. But then, of course, we had the Great Recession, and during recessions, countries import less. And so you saw this, this improvement. But the other thing that happened, of course, is that the U.S. started to produce more oil. And so you see the red component shrinking. It is no longer adding very much to the U.S. deficit. But what isn't shrinking, and this is the essence of the complaint, is the non-petroleum deficit. And that's the blue bit. That just continues to rise. Okay, and you can see it here. Uh, the first chart there is basically the chart I just showed you all in blue. But then the other chart is China. And you can see there the numbers are somewhere, I'd have to look because it's hard to see here, but its numbers are somewhere north of 380 billion as the U.S. has this deficit with China, with Europe north of 150, and with Japan somewhere in the neighborhood of 70. These three blocks make up more than 70% of the U.S. trade deficit. Canada, by the way, makes up nothing in the trade deficit. Okay? We have a current account deficit with the United States, right? And, and that's because there's a tremendous amount of interest and um, dividend payments going from Canada to the United States. So, I don't know why Trump comes up with, you know, let's, let's tariff Canada. I think this is just one of the things that, you know, he's a bit of a loose cannon. I think we can agree on that. And so, but obviously that's going to be taken out. But these are serious issues because I showed these charts two years ago, if not three years ago, if not four years ago, and they're only getting worse. Okay, now here you have the current account 
balance. Okay, now the current account takes in trade of goods and services, right? as well as interest payments, dividend payments, uh, tourism, and all that sort of stuff. And you can see here that for a major group of these countries, the current account deficit is forecast by the IMF to rise. Interestingly, and I don't believe it, it is forecast for China to decline. Now, I have no counter to this, and China keeps publishing data that says that their trade defi deficit is shrinking. But I'm a little suspicious of the data, much as I am suspicious of the data that China publishes on their gold holdings. Yeah, but that's a, a little bit different. OK, now you see a bunch of countries have current account surpluses. Obviously, in the global economy, everything balances. One group has a surplus, somebody must have a deficit. Guess who? the United States. And if you look at this on a percent of GDP basis, you see that the largest in the world, except for one country, is Germany. It's over 8% of GDP. Okay, now I have a little, uh, I had a quote on the other one is, let me read it here. The, pr the protectionist US president is forcing Europeans to face the unsettling problem of their massive current account surplus, which has been the best indicator of everything that's wrong with the monetary union in the last five years. That's not me speak, it's another economist. Okay? There is an overproduction in Europe and an underconsumption. And you can figure out who is overproducing and who is underconsuming, right? But the chart here tells you. Yeah. Now, what I left off this chart is the Swiss current account surplus. Now, that is an anomaly. That's 10% of GDP, okay? So, you can take a bow, but that's how it is. But the point I'm making is there are huge surpluses in the world and there is one large deficit, okay? Literally speaking, the U.S. is the consumer of last resort, okay? Now, and that's, how, that's, that's how they think of it over there, okay? And that's certainly what Trump is facing, and he says, I've had it. I'm not, I, I don't want to go this direction anymore. And so that's one of the things that is going to happen. Now, this might be a little bit difficult uh, to see, but I've got some circles here. This table is based on a model that the Peterson Institute for International Economics uses to try to estimate what is a fair exchange rate. Okay, now they base it on current account balances, and what we have done is force the current account balance, so you see their Muren Beald estimates, I think I have a thing here, Muren Beald estimates. We use their model to force a current account balance of zero. So all these bars that I just showed you, they're all going to go to zero. What would be the appropriate exchange rate to have that come about? Now, this is a bit fictitious because, let's be honest, you're, you're not going to have zero current account balances around the world. Some are going to be in deficit, some are in surplus. But it gives us an idea of what the currency should be. Well, it turns out that the U.S. dollar is on average about 32% overvalued, right? The euro is about 33% undervalued. Um, and Japan, 40% overvalued, you can see the numbers here, okay? These are significant numbers. Okay. Now, you say the euro, 33% overvalued at, at whatever the number was at that time, which was 118, 120. Well, at the moment, it's 123. Okay, let me put that in perspective from my view. The euro probably ought to be 90 cents when it comes to some of the southern European countries. But for Germany, it could probably operate reasonably well at 180 to 2. Huh? Now, and what would 180 to 2 do for Germany? Well, A, it makes their products much more expensive, but it gives that much more purchasing power to, you, to German consumers. And that's one of the things that currencies do. Okay, so this, this is one, if you will, more academic way of evaluating what um, currency should be worth. This is a less academic way. All of you have probably read The Economist at one time or another, and you know that once a year, The Economist has, which is a great thing at the universities, because you, know, you, you teach about 
purchasing power parity and so forth, and they have what they call the McDonald's hamburger standard. Okay, what they do is they measure prices of McDonald's around the world, and someone suggested to me, uh, I think it was this morning, he says, you know, we should do this with, um, with uh, Starbucks, okay? Uh, your, your basic Pike coffee, right? Your Pike market coffee, it's sold around the world, we could probably do a calculation, and it's, it's, it's the same bean. You know, this is not always the same beef, but be that as it may, Malaysia has a super cheap McDonald's hamburger. So currency is overvalued, and, and it suggests something in the neighborhood of 50%. Okay? You may be pleased to note, because you probably don't want to eat it, that the McDonald's hamburger is the most expensive in the world right here in Switzerland. Uh -huh. Well, that tells you something about the currency. The currency is actually one of the very few in the world that's overvalued on any kind of measurement relative to the U.S. dollar. And I find that interesting. But, but you know, this is just kind of what you, what you feel when you go around by. So here we have a chart of the U.S. dollar. Now you can see here, that, and I have different traces, because there is no one measure for the U.S. dollar. What we do is we build baskets of how the U.S. dollar moves against a group of currencies, right? And so we include some currencies, we don't include others. We have a wide basket, a narrow basket, and so forth. But they all show the same thing, that the dollar has gone through these waves. Okay, well, you can, if you go back into history, you'll, you, you'll quickly recognize the waves. From 80 to 84, the dollar went straight up. That's a no-brainer. Volcker raised interest rates to 20%, right? And Ronald Reagan was elected. Now, Ronald Reagan cut taxes, he cut depreciation allowances, and so forth. There was an investment boom. In the second half of the 90s, I'm sure most of you shove, you know, funneled, I don't want to say shovel, it sounds, it sounds a little bit too dramatic, but you funneled some money into the U.S. equity market, and more specifically, into the tech sector. I remember ar around 2000 and thereabouts, I got a phone call from my sister-in-law, um, she lives in Amsterdam. Now, my sister-in-law has never owned a stock in her life. I get a phone call, and she says, Martin, my boss is telling me I should put $20,000 into XYZ.com. What do you think? I said, don't do it. And I wrote in my report, the peak of the dot-com bubble has been reached. <laughs> okay? So, but anyways, the dollar the dollar went. Now, if you look at gold, of course, you'll see the exact reverse. So what do we think? Well, you see that line at the end there, the, the, the arrow with the question mark. And then I have a little note here. The fate of reserve currencies is to decline over time. Now, that is just a historical observation, because one of the things that happens when you are the premier reserve currency, other currencies become undervalued relative to your currency. They do this by hook and by crook, by amassing reserves in your currency, uh, manipulating, uh, you know, basically buying dollars in the foreign exchange market, selling domestic currencies. If you don't believe me, read the whole saga of how sterling was the premier reserve currency, and then, of course, in the 1930s, well, late I think it was late 20s, sterling was taken off the gold standard. Okay? As you saw this slip because sterling was grossly overvalued. Okay, so that, that happens. New economies emerge. They're hard-working economies. You've got new economies in Asia. People work very hard, right? And they make good products. And their currencies should rise. That's how they get compensated. That's how the workers get compensated. So this is a natural phenomena, and I'm, 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 I'm going with that, because the long-run direction of the dollar is to go down. And it's not, oh, terrible dollar. No, it is other economies are emerging. And so this is a natural readjustment of things that are going on. Okay, so now I've got a, 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 the question, and I have two answers. Why will the dollar roll over again? <clears throat> well, there's no... Uh, uh, this, you know, for, for economists, this is fairly simple. If you have a high trade deficit, that subtracts directly from GDP. So, you know, one of the reasons you get a low GDP 
score for the United States is because they had a large trade deficit. Okay? The other thing that a high currency does is it discourages domestic investment for export purposes. Now, that's a question you want to think about. You know, all these companies that under new tax legislation are going to bring all this money back to the United States. And, you know, some, some people say, oh, there's going to be an investment, you know, um, nirvana, because what are they going to do with all this money? Well, maybe they're just going to buy shares back. I don't know. Okay? Because why would you want to, at the current price of the U.S. dollar, build some production facility that is going to export? It's not a competitive currency. Okay? Now, if you took it down 40%, hey, that changes the equation quite significantly. I also say the high dollar suppresses inflation, and as anybody is a Fed watcher, they would understand this. You know, one of the things that the Federal Reserve, of course, wants was, is a little higher inflation. So actually, with a lower dollar, you can kill two birds with one stone. You can get a little goose in the GDP, and you can get a little goose in inflation. And that's really what is required uh, for the U.S. economy. Then there is the political argument. I don't know if you've ever seen this guy, um, but this, these quotes here are taken directly from his 2016 electioneering book. Okay, I'm going to identify every violation in all trade agreements we have with everybody, right? I'm going to label China a currency manipulator, etc., etc. May I say to you, this is one of the first times I've seen a president who actually is following up on what he said while he was electioneering. Now, that's not necessarily a plus, and many of you won't like Trump. You know, it was an excellent article, actually, in the Wall Street Journal. <clears throat> I think it was about a couple of months ago. And the title of the article is, Everything I like about Trump is his policies. Or was it the only thing I like about Trump is his policies? Anyway, he, the author, it was an editorial, and he, he went into, if I had to sit down over lunch with Trump, I wouldn't know what to talk about. The man is a, a, a buffoon, he's narcissistic. That, what kind of a conversation would you have with this guy? Okay? If I had to sit down with Obama, I'd be talking for hours. A gentleman, pleasant person, you know, I, I, I met him once briefly, it, perfect gentleman, can't stand his policies. That was what this article was about. And so this is what you have to see through. You're dealing here with a personality you're not going to like, but these are the policies he wants to put through, and he got elected, which is, I think, an, an important little side. So with him at the helm, a trade war is, lo is looming. So I just give you a little bit of background. I'm Canadian, I was born in Holland. So I feel I'm a little bit international, and I live, uh, as, as many snowbirds from Canada do, I live just under six months of the year. That's, but the U.S. only allows you 182 days. I live for just under 182 days of the year. I live in California. Okay, and I, I think I have a pretty good read on how Americans feel about things. And I'll tell you this, U.S. voters feel the U.S. has gotten a bum deal from the rest of the world, and that has been building. And it's been building in, on, on many avenues. Now, I say here in the non-economic arena, and I, I'm not a political scientist, so I've only put down two that come up periodically, but there are many. Okay, but I'll tell you one, the UN. I would imagine half of the people in the United States would love to lift that building up out of New York, send it over to Geneva, and never pay another dollar. That's how they feel about it. I kid you not. Okay. Second, you saw right off the bat, Trump gets elected, I am quitting NATO, I'm out of here, the hell with him, right? Uh, Trump's a negotiator, all of that means nothing. The bottom line is, NATO is now starting to pay a little bit more for defense. And I include Canada, because Canada is actually an embarrassment to us Canadians with respect to what we pay on defense. It's less than 1%. The NATO agreements are very clear. 2% or more of GDP must be allocated to defense. Okay. So it's these sorts of things. Now, in the economic arena, I feel a little bit more comfortable. Currency manipulation by other countries. Okay, that's been well documented. You read many articles on this. The dollar overvaluation. Trade and non-trade barriers to U.S. goods. Okay, I know some of you say, oh, well, yeah, but the U.S. has those too. 
We're talking degrees here. There is no country in the world that is clean on trade. I'll tell you that. Okay? It is all relative. What are the barriers you face coming into North America? What are the barriers North American producers face going somewhere else? There's no comparison. And then, of course, the particular thing that is difficult for the U.S. to deal with because there is no easy way to retaliate, so that's why tariffs are being introduced as a way of retaliating, it has to do with the, uh, the expropriation of intellectual property. And I have seen this firsthand. You know, any of you that have traveled to uh, China and have talked with, you know, um, uh, business people from Canada or the United States, as I have, they will tell you right away, yeah, we sold a wonderful piece of machinery to the Chinese five years ago. You know, it's a state-of-the-art piece of machinery. I had this, you know, from a fellow from, from Montreal. It was a debarking machine, you know, and, of course, Canada is good at that sort of stuff. And he says, I'm here because I thought we were going to get a lot of orders. Right? We're, 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 we're at the front edge of this sort of stuff. And I met with the people that I sold it to, and guess what? I saw 20 machines. Now, if you're a politician, you say, ah, you know, countries do these sorts of things. If that is your business, with your technical expertise, you're ready to kill. Okay? And slowly but surely, all of that starts to percolate up the political ladder. And now it has come to the White House, and there are two people. One you should pay particular attention to, Peter Navarro. He is a very, very anti-China um, economist, and he's got several books out on this. So these are things that have been percolating in the past, and now you've got Trump as being elected. I say there in the bracket, Clinton also campaigned on fair and reciprocal trade, but I don't need to speak too much about her because she's... She's obviously um, gone off into the sunset. Uh, I'm not sure she's making much money anymore for her speeches and whatnot. Uh, those things you tend to do when you have a little bit of legislative clout. Um, okay, but there is another thing, which is more, if you will, an economist view of what is going on with respect to this. And I think this is important to understand. I'm sure all of you understand it implicitly when you travel in North America. Okay, and so I say here, the U.S. has a consumer bias. Now, I don't know if there is an amendment in the U.S. Constitution that says, U.S. consumers must enjoy the right of the lowest prices in the world. Okay, but you're damn close to that. Okay, I'm sure it hit you when you try to... God, things are cheap here, okay, right? I mean, I go so far as to say that the U.S. has more consumer advocacy groups than Europe has bureaucrats. Right? It is, this is the right, I and mean, the minute Trump says something about, well, we should tariff that, boom, there are 500 people out there speaking about how this is going to cost the consumer more. All this crap stuff that comes from some of these countries, it's going to cost the consumer more. I mean, who cares? but that's the U.S., okay? So that's the way it is set up, okay? And the U.S. does have among the lowest tariff and non-tariff barriers in the world. Okay, now what about the other countries? Because, you know, I just showed you, other countries have surpluses and the U.S. has deficits. Okay, the U.S. likes to consume. Other countries like to produce. Okay, so we, in economics we call it, you have producer bias or consumer bias. I mean, as a, as a good politician, you're supposed to be equal, you know? The, Consumer, consumer gains versus uh, producer losses, and, uh, you know, that sort of, you balance that out. Okay, what, what, what is the critical policy objective of other countries? Production and employment. Do you actually think that China, at the highest level, cares an awful lot about what the consumers there are consuming? They care an awful lot about what is being produced and sold. Okay, you, want, you don't want people demonstrating in the streets. You want them employed. That's the system. Okay, and that has got to be rejiggered. Otherwise, we're stuck with these imbalances. And, you know, as I, as I said, the result that is very visible, the U.S. is the consumer of last resort. Trade partners literally dump their 
excess production into the U.S. economy, and of course the U.S. consumers are ecstatic. They get the cheapest prices in the world. U.S. producers are not so happy. Okay, now, but up until China, the economists argue that you know the happiness of consumers outweighs the unhappiness of the producers. But more recently, some papers have been produced to show that the size of China is so great that you're actually getting into a point where the producer is being hurt, and of course, the producer wearing another hat is the consumer. And if the producer becomes unemployed, you can't consume. So that has set other things into motion about how to deal with all of this. Okay, my fix is the dollar. There meant many parts to this, but the dollar has to has to come down. And I just want to remind you: this is a chart of the Chinese renminbi. Okay, you might have forgotten that the renminbi was less than two to the dollar back in the 1980s, and they devalued 82 percent to this point. Then they joined the WTO. Now, if you look at any charts of China, reserve gains, production, growth, etc., since 2001, China has been on a tear. Okay? One of the things that's helped them, of course, is a very competitive currency. They've kept it competitive because they went from zero reserves to, at one point, four trillion dollars of reserves. This, of course, was the money that helped destroy the U.S. and international housing markets, but that's a whole different story. Okay. But that's what happens. They just keep the RMB low, collect U.S. dollars, dump them back into the U.S. Treasury market or wherever, and carry on. Okay. What is a tariff? Well, to an economist, a tariff is a devaluation by other means. You see where we're going here? Right? You want to put up tariffs, you're better off just devaluing. Okay? And that's kind of what comes out. And this, of course, is very important to how one looks at um, a gold. Okay, but I haven't fully finished with this particular topic. It's, uh, it's been dear to my heart. And so for the next uh, hour or so, I'll show you some charts <laughs> on, uh, on, on, on car prices. But I decided, because you know, those of us, and all of you travel back and forth across the Atlantic, and it must hit you at some point what the price of A is and what the price of A is at home, right? And you do this with cameras, you do this with all kinds of stuff. Okay, so I thought, you know what I'm going to do for, for this evening? I'm going to go to the internet, and I'm going to be a shopper on the internet, and I am going to look for the Mercedes-Benz E-Class. It's made in Germany, it's sold around the world. And the Mercedes-Benz website, very efficient, who would have thought, right? Very efficient, and you can just click on a country and it will give you the local retail price of the basic model. Okay, there are the retail prices. In the US, 52,950, in Canada, 62, the yen here, the pound here, um, uh, Germany here, Switzerland here. So now I apply some exchange rates. These are not deadly accurate. The Canadian dollar has improved a little bit. Uh, and I think the, you know, you're closer to 0.96 now than maybe 0.95. And I converted them to U.S. dollars. Okay? So this is buying a car in the local market. Okay, now, some of you are going to say, and I heard that this morning, yeah, but you know, the Mercedes-Benz that's sold in Europe doesn't have some of the things that the Mercedes-Benz sold in the U.S. has. Okay. One or two percent doesn't matter. The currency exchange rate already fluctuates enough to, to not worry about this. But the thing that I want to point out to you, other than Japan being the highest, that will show up all the time, by the way, other than Japan being the highest, the Mercedes-Benz, on average, this is 102, that's in these three countries, I average it out, it's 102% of the U.S. price. Okay? In other words, a car that's made in Europe sells for about the same price in North America on the exchange. 
pretty straightforward. Canada is cheap because everything always gets priced in Canada to the 85 cent dollar. And of course, when the, when the Canadian dollar goes down, we profit tremendously. So we happen to have the lowest Mercedes Benz prices in the world at this point in time. Thank you. Okay, well, that's a European car the Jaguar. Okay, I'm just, I, just pick, I, I thought I'd pick on some names that you'd recognize as cars. I don't recognize these cars, I don't buy that stuff. You know, I drive a cheap little Toyota, but that, that, that's another thing. Uh, anyway, the Jaguar. Okay, the same thing shows up. 100%, about 107%, within the reasonable limits of tolerance. Now, I, I, I did this first because some years ago, I, ha I, I happened to be in London, and the office that we had, it was Dundee, I'm no longer with Dundee, but the office we had in uh, Dundee, I think it was on the Berkeley Square, and right around the corner was the Lexus dealer, and I happened to have a Lexus, not the Toyota, and I walked in, and I saw my car, and I said, how much is this car? And I fell over. It was about 60% more than what I paid. All right. Okay, so, first point. Cars made in Europe sell very competitively in North America, roughly the same price. Okay, we're not going to quibble over, uh, you know, uh, uh, costs of uh, shipment and all that stuff. That's that, that's minor stuff. Okay, the Lexus RX 350. I don't know if any of you know this car. It's it's an SUV and it's a very popular car. What you don't know, I suspect, is that the RX 350, although it's a Japanese car. It's made in Canada. Okay? Now look at the numbers. Okay? And you say, wow, hey, just a minute. You have done something wrong, Martin. Okay, this can't be right. Okay? 100, 102. Japan, hey, 131. I didn't show you on the other one, but again, the Jaguar was more expensive in Japan. But now look at this. 150% more. So I said, what gives? So somebody said, well, yeah, but the engine is larger, and I, I don't want to bore you. Mercedes-Benz engines aren't that small either, okay? So another one, the Corvette. I thought, let me pick a quintessential American car, because I couldn't find a decent representation of a Chevy, okay? But Chevy has like 20 models, and God knows which one they sell in different parts of the world. But the Corvette is made in the United States, and it's this particular model that is sold around the world, the Corvette, a grand sport. I think most of you have seen one. They're racy-looking machines. Oops, sorry. 170% higher. Okay? Now, I did this with cars. I also did the Toyota Prius. I see more of them here. But the Toyota Prius is a tremendous car for cabbies because you're doing a lot of city driving, and the hybrid system is, when it first came out, I said it, I still believe it, it is better than any other system. I know that it, for a while there, the Europeans felt that, you know, the, the, the diesel engine, the one that, you know, you had to have additives to and all that, was better. Well, of course, that got blown uh, apart with the, the Volkswagen scandal. Okay. The Toyota Prius hybrid, same thing. 50%. And you know what? It's made in Japan, and it sells for about 130% in Japan over the U.S. price. There has never in my travels been an occasion where I've had a Japanese product that I bought in North America, and I compared it to the price in Japan, where it was actually cheaper in Japan. It's never happened. Okay? And I have... I have Documents to prove some of this stuff. It's crazy. Japan is what we used to call dumping stuff on the global market. And dumping, the original definition, some of you are as old as I am, the original definition of dumping was selling a product in the foreign market below what you sell it for in the domestic market. All of this now has come up, and this is going to create a tremendous amount of friction over the next six or eight years. I guarantee this. This has been festering, and it's now coming up. And this is the sort of summation on that, with one small exception. It was the Jaguar, I think. In, in. Prices in Canada are lower, prices in the U.S. and Canada are lower than elsewhere, right? 
European cars are similarly priced in North America, right? But North American cars sold in Europe are absolutely not similarly priced. And Japan charges much more on everything, including their homemade cars. Okay. So you have Trump coming around and saying, you know, I'm fed up with the auto tariffs. Well, here's the point. Okay. Whew, I need a drink after that. <laughs> okay, I thought I'd say something about equity markets because obviously we've had a bit of a, a decline in, uh, in equity markets. And so what I've got here is the trace of the S&P 500, obviously the many, many equity markets. This is just a representative equity market. And you can see that it has uh, come down quite significantly in you know, the first so many months uh, uh, of this year. The first thing I want to point out to you is that this is not that unusual. I know that each time the market goes through all of this, oh my God, we're going to have a recession, you know, the global economy is going to end, we got a trade war, we got this, Europe is falling apart, you name it, the equity market is never going to rise again. And these earlier ones, they took over a year to kind of work out. That's also pretty normal. If the equity markets are about at the current levels or starting to reach for new highs about a year from now, that's pretty normal. Okay? So that's the first thing I want to say. Now, we have ways of trying to value the equity markets, and we tend not to use price-to-earnings ratios. The very simple reason for not using price-to-earnings ratios, they have a use, is that you can't really look at price-to-earnings ratios without reference to what the prevailing interest rate is. Okay, let's be simple. When Volcker raised interest rates to 20%, you don't have a 20 price-to-earnings ratio on the stock market. Okay? You might have a 6 or a 5. You know what I'm saying? If you have interest rates that are at global rock bottom, you ought to expect high price-to-earnings ratios. And so that's what, I, what I've got here. Here I've got the earnings yield of the S&P, and I subtract from it the 10-year bond yield. And you can see it's in, still in the positive. It turns out that the long-run average of this is about zero. So this does not suggest that the market is particularly over, uh, oversight. And I, I point this out because we do have a, a, a report that we put out every uh, two months where we value the markets plus their sectors. The other thing I like to look at, what is the dividend yield of the S&P 500 relative to the long-term interest rate? And you know what? It ain't bad. Okay? Equity markets have gone up, but so have dividend yields relative to the interest rate. I say, yeah, but you know, the trade war, the recession, and so forth. Well, one of the best recession indicators, and I think there's an article in, uh, in the Wall Street Journal today on this, is what we call the yield curve. Okay, for those of you that are just a little too esoteric, don't worry about it. I'll get to more interesting stuff in a minute. But this is, this is the long-term yield, less short-term yield. Okay? And when that goes negative, as it did here, 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 and here, this is the zero line. So when short-term rates go above long-term rates, the probability of a recession goes straight up. Now, recessions are typically what kills the stock market. So we pay attention to that. Here is where we are. Okay? This is not that unusual. I'm not yet concerned that we're breaking. And if you just trend this out, we're not, we're not looking until very late uh, 19 or 20. And you can see here, you know, that we had years of this thing coming down before you actually had a recession. We are in an unusual economic phase. This is a post-depression phase. That, the best way that I'd like to describe it. We should have had a depression, but because of the monetary policy profligacy, which you've all complained about, okay, but because we had that, we didn't have a depression. Okay. Case closed. So I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not too worried, so I, I think the stock market will correct. What you are going to see, however, is interest rates rising. 
we are at the very end of a very long period of declining interest rates. Okay, so this is the 10-year yield, and you see, I'm not a technical analyst, but you see there is a little bit of a breakout being suggested. But more interestingly, this is a picture of U.S. interest rates that goes back to 1798. I, it's important what happened in 1798 with respect to these interest rates, so, you know, I've got to write about that. That's, that's what we do. Economists, by the way, were great at looking backwards. So, for me, this is a superb chart. I don't have to know anything about today. Yeah. But you can see that the interest rate goes through waves. Okay? That, there's reasons for that. doesn't concern us at this point. What concerns us is that we're at the end of a massive down wave. That's what this long cycle picture tells me. Now, whether it is a sort of modestly rising arrow or whether it is sharp rising arrow, I vote for the modestly rising one because if it goes up sharply, we have another issue, which I'll talk about in a minute, which is global debt. Interest rates going up too fast is going to cause a phenomenal amount of problems. One other thing I'll leave you with respect to equities, and this is one of my favorite charts, and I'll explain it. This is a cyclical picture of the S&P 500, right, in terms of um, uh, 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 total returns and as well as the index. Now, what am I drawing here exactly? I am drawing the percentage change between, let's say, March month end this year, 2018, and March month end 2008. An exact 10-year percent change. Okay? Then we divide it by 10. Okay? So now you pick up these cycles. And I've used this chart, uh, well, uh, when I was chief economist at Dundee, and obviously we had a lot of uh, presentations with respect to our wealth management division, so uh, very interesting. So what you see here are big cycles that we're going through, and I can't tell you what the next big cycle up is, but I have guesses, right? We are in the process of actually beginning to incorporate the microprocessor and all its additions into everything. Okay, this is like, you know, the steam engine gave way to the electric motor. And, you know, that takes 30 or 40 years to work out. I had people that write about that. Robert Gordon is one person that writes about these sorts of things. So, anyways, I leave that with you. So, I, I, I'm probably a bit of, a, of, a, of an equity bull. And I think it's a good time to be invested, generally speaking. Okay, speaking of equities, gold equities. Okay, what I've got here is the ratio of the TSX gold index. Okay, and I've converted it to U.S. dollars, obviously, and I divided by the gold price. So this is just a very simple equity to gold bullion ratio. Okay. What am I trying to say here? What I'm trying to say is, now the data goes back to 84, and that's because the XAU started in 84, so we collected the data from 1984. But you can see here, the trend from 1984 to the Great Recession was positive. Okay? So in other words, the market was paying a little bit higher all the time for gold equities relative to gold bullion. Now look at since 2008. It's been a disaster. And this is not just the TSX. The XAU shows the same thing. Now, we started to look at this very early because, you know, people say, you know, what might be causing this? I mean, you could, you could pick up this trend. And one of the things that I know from experience is sometimes the underlying structure of things begins to change before a recession, but you don't actually measure it or see it clearly until after the recession. I'll give, give you a case in point. Gold ETF was introduced in 2003. And the prevailing view from 2003 to the Great Recession was, the more gold ETFs are sold, the higher the gold price, the better it is for the gold equities. Statistically, we could measure that. And we found a positive 
in a multi, multivariate regression model, we found a positive impact. Okay. That all disappeared after the recession. Now, the more gold bullion is sold, the more it subtracts from gold equities. Okay. Now, very early on, uh, one of, uh, one of uh, uh, the people at the Dynamic Mutual Funds, which was the company that, that was owned by Dundee, and it you know, had about 50 billion under management, it was a, a decent company. One of the guys said there, he said, Martin, you, can, you talk about gold and so forth, you know what I'm going to do? And this was around 2007. He says, you know, I can't figure all this stuff out. I'm just going to buy bullion and not take the management risk, the exploration risk, the everything risk that is involved. And that's kind of gotten into the picture. Okay, so that's what I say here. From my perspective, now, and that's just a narrow perspective. I deal with data and I try to measure and so forth, right? But from my perspective, slowly but surely, investors who wanted an exposure to gold began to choose bullion. In fact, we had, a, I introduced a fund for Dynamic, which was 50% gold and 50% equities. You could do that in Canada. Right? And it was a very popular fund. People wanted that stabilization of gold versus the equities. Right? So that's what we started to pick up on, that you know, there's no, none of this operation. The second thing, and you heard that on the panel, investors have begun to demand you know, kind of return, profit per ounce, dividends, whatever, but a return. I attended one of the... Um, uh, Denver Gold Group um, uh, uh, conferences, I think it was around 2007 or 2006, and one of, the, one of the big gold fund managers in the world, there were two Grahams, and I can't recall both their names, but they're from London. It might have been Graham Birch or the other Graham. Anyways, I thought he had, you know, really <clears throat> like this, because he stood up over lunch in a room full of, you know, barracks, and he put a chart up there, and he said, here's the chart of Procter & Gamble. And the chart goes like this. He says, here is the chart of this, Barrick. And it went down. And there was a hush in the room. And he says, they're destroying capital. And I thought, oh, God, nobody's ever going to ask him back, right? <laughs> anyway, but that, that attitude, I think, has come into play a little bit. And that is, to me the singular most important thing that the gold equity uh, managers, the, the miners, have to address. And you heard, it is being addressed. That's what I say at the bottom. I think uh, is on the next slide. Miners have received the message. That's my sense of things. Okay, that is it. that's what I hear now in presentations. Okay, it's not, uh, we're going to produce 100 million ounces at a loss. No, we're going to produce 1 million ounces or 500 ounces at a profit. Whoa, that's new. Okay, and so given that I am probably more bullish on the gold price than I can ever remember being, and normally I'm very hedged, right? There's A, there's B, and so forth. But I'm very bullish on the gold. And we have the miners getting what I believe is a message that has been long overdue, I think it is an excellent time to step in. But I'm not, I'm not trying to blow a smoke up anybody's... Uh, I, that just happens to be my opinion. And if it wasn't, I wouldn't, uh, uh, I, I wouldn't uh, I tell you that. So let's from there go to the gold price, and then I'll close off. Okay, you may have seen a chart like this. It happens to appear in, uh, in our uh, weekly report with great regularity. This is the price of gold, you know, and it was going down, and now it's going up, and I've drawn trend lines. Not that I know anything about trend lines. Let me be clear on this. You know, I'm an economist. Uh, you know, it, all these lines are very interesting, but I don't know what they mean. Other than the technical people that tell me, say, gold is coming into a triangle, there is a, an uptrend line that it isn't going to break, and it's got to break through the top. Now, whatever that all means, my message to you is, gold is going to break higher. I have no idea when. The second thing that this chart shows is this here. I believe that the new bull market in gold started at the end of 2015. We had a slight interruption, and some of you will remember this. Believe it or not, 
the markets got all overjoyed over the Trump election and stimulus and tax cuts and everything were going to boost the U.S. economy, right? And the dollar went up and it was going to be hallelujah. And I'm sitting there, I, said, I don't believe it, I don't believe it. Because the, the fundamental thing I believed all along is that Trump is negative for the dollar. And that's what all this trade stuff is about. Okay, well, let's... Look at some of the bullish case. I've shown you the charts on the dollar, so you know my first argument. The dollar is overvalued. That's about 75% of my argument on gold. The dollar goes down, gold goes up, barring anything else. Global debt crisis, geopolitical... I, I won't hit each one of those points, but I'm going to give you some representative uh, uh, bits there. The global debt crisis. Okay, now, I, I can never seem to give a presentation without at least mentioning the global debt crisis because it's been kind of uppermost in my mind since uh, I read an article back in, whatever, 2003, that the baby boomers were going to retire. And I thought, oh my God, the baby boomers are going to retire. How about that? And of course, then the next question is, who the hell is going to pay for it all? Okay. Well, that's what you got here. Here you have what you call super-aging, the percentage of old people relative to young people. And this is what's happening in the global economy. Okay? I'm after my kids to produce grandchildren. You know what? We have a grand cat. Okay. Listen, they got to help out. That's what I'm telling them, right? They're, get in there. Okay. Anyway, so that's one thing. Okay, then the second thing is, as you get older, you've got to be taken care of. Now, this happens to be the way the U.S. government spends its budget. Canada spends its budget like this. I haven't looked at the Swiss budget, okay? I have no doubt it's similar. Entitlements dominate government's budgets. Now, I'm an old conservative. And I remember the days in 1970 when the biggest item in the budget was defense expenditure. And I'm sorry to say, I still believe that's the way it should be. Okay? You're supposed to take care of yourself or you're supposed to have good fund managers to pick the good stocks to make sure that you're taken care of in your old age. But the government has gotten into this business. Okay? So everybody now is entitled. Okay? Now, what is an entitlement? The U.S. has a clear definition. A payment to an individual for which no service need be provi provided. It's just a one-way payment. Okay, you, you qualify because uh, the law says you qualify. You're old, you need doctors, whatever. Okay, what's left? Well, let me show you what's left. And you can pretty well start to count countries out as to what they're doing. But if this is the entitlement chunk, What's left is defense, infrastructure, the running of the government, and interest on the debt. Okay, now the U.S. is in the interesting position of having this high entitlement, and the U.S. doesn't want to cut its defense. Now, I tend to agree with that, but that's a, a personal, you know, view that I would vote for that, but that's my view. Okay, so what gets squeezed in the U.S.? Well, have any of you ridden on the roads in the U.S. recently? Or landed at LaGuardia? I mean, a th we used to say third world country. A developing, developing country would be embarrassed to have that sort of an airport. Okay? So that's what's happened. Okay? Now, of course, in Europe it goes differently. Great entitlements. Great infrastructure, and I understood that the Dutch were able to send two soldiers to Afghanistan. <laughs> okay? That's how you choose to spend your money. Obviously, not the way Trump wants you to spend the money, but that, that's it. So this is a serious problem, and it means that government debt ratios are going to rise. You can see it here from the BIS data. All these lines, it doesn't even matter what color line, there's only one line that is kind of flat to going down, and that, oopsie daisy, and that is the German line. Okay? Germany under-consumes, saves, so its debt doesn't go up. But everybody else's debt's going up. Okay. 
So what can governments do? This is my second favorite slide after the, um, the debt one. There's two things, okay? And you can, you can see it a little bit in the microcosm of Europe. Europe has a, quotes, fixed exchange rate system. That is, Greece has the same currency as Germany, right? So how do you make that work? The shift to more austerity, okay? Cut entitlements, raise taxes, accept deflation and depression. And you want to look at the data from some of the southern European countries, that's, of course, exactly what you see, okay? Okay, but now, switch over. You got the ECB, you got the Fed, you got the Bank of Japan, you got other major banks. And what has become the most important objective of these central banks? Employment. Okay? The objective is maximum employment at stable inflation. Now, that's the, how it's spelled out for the Fed, but all countries. So what happens when debt grows? Well, presumably interest rates rise, but if interest rates rise, that could mean the currency rises, and that could mean a, s a suppression of economic growth, and that could mean the central bank has to step in and ease. So whether you like it or not, you're going to have some kind of monetization. And this will happen without even thinking about it. Unemployment has gone up. Ooh, we got to ease policy. That's how it goes. No, it's not, no, no, right. So that's how I see things going. I see things going very much in the gold positive. I say here financial repression. I don't know if you fully understand that, but let me give you an example. In Canada years ago, um, in our uh, registered retirement savings plans, you know, you can put money aside for your, you know, your old age, and that would be tax-free. Okay, wonderful. But you had to invest it in Canadian government bonds. Okay, you didn't have a choice. That happens, and it's been talked about. Okay? Well, we can fund the government deficit, take all those damn, you know, uh, 401As and, and whatever programs you have, right? Dump them into government bonds. The government passes the law and it's done. Okay, so these are the sorts of things. Okay, also for gold, the geopolitical crisis. I don't have to talk about this. You know this as, as well as I do. You got the, you got the Islam, uh, Islam problem within Islam. Forget about the problem that may or may not be created here or elsewhere. Within Islam, this is a, a massive problem. You got Syria. Okay, Syria, at one brief moment, it was kind of like 1980, you know, a superpower face-off, Russia versus the U.S. Okay, it makes you very nervous. I'll show you a, a chart there. North Korea. Now, what I like about North Korea, which is nothing, but what I like about the topic North Korea is that a friend of mine sent me a quote by Bill Clinton, and I think it was 1997, and the quote was words to the effect, we have just concluded an agreement with North Korea, and I want to assure the world that we will never, ever have to worry again about nuclear weapons in North Korea. About five years ago, this was followed up by John Kerry, who was the minister, uh, you know, the, 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 the foreign minister for the, for the United States, declaring that we have just concluded an agreement with Syria and Russia, and I want to assure the world we never ever have to worry again about chemical weapons being used in Syria. Okay. That's how it goes. Okay. That's why I put this point here, U.S. leadership. Trump is erratic, you don't have to like the guy. I don't like the guy, okay? But things are going to change, whether you like him or not. They're going to change unless at some point he, uh, he is, um, um, come on, what do you call it when he's impeached, right? Okay, that, 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 it's unlikely that that is going to happen. Yeah, maybe Stormy Daniels has the ability to do that or Melania, but, but other than that, you know, it's going to take some effort. So, from a gold perspective, not to lose the train here, from a gold perspective, when you got all these little fires going on that could suddenly flare up, and you have a leadership in the United States that is very significantly changing the trend of where the U.S. is going to lead and how it's going to lead, 
because over the last umpteen presidents, the U.S. has been going into this direction, and Trump obviously doesn't want to go in that direction, and nor do the voters, you're going to have these sorts of issues. This was the massive geopolitical bubble in the gold price. This was 1980. Iran took hostages, U.S. hostages, and Russia moved into Afghanistan. The gold price doubled from 400 to 850. That's the biggest one we have measured of a geopolitical nature. And in the back of my mind, I'm worried we're going to see something like this again, just to be you know, straight honest about it. Okay, are there any negative outlooks? Well, an economist can always find something, right? The central banks are going to tighten policy. Okay, let me tell you here, this is, this blue line is the U.S. Fed funds rate. So that's the, the rate that the, the Federal Reserve sets. The blue bars are periods when interest rates in the U.S. were rising. The yellow, whoops, I keep doing this. The yellow line is the gold price. Now, these circles tell you what the gold price did during periods of tightening. In the 80s, when the U.S. tightened, it tightened seriously. Remember I said Volcker, 20% interest rates? Nothing goes up when interest rates are pushed to 20%. But that's no longer the case. 2.3%, 3.9%, 78%, 26%. The very fact that the U.S. is raising interest rates has nothing to say about what the gold price is going to do. It's actually much more important what the real interest rate is going to do. Okay? And the real interest rate isn't expected to even turn positive much before year-end 2019. So that's not a worry I have. The other worry is what my economist colleagues tell me which is true. The combination of tighter monetary policies, that's what you're seeing in the United States, with expansionary fiscal policies will raise interest rates, which will draw money in from abroad, which will raise the price of the U.S. dollar. So all of those people that think the U.S. dollar is going up will have a variant of this argument. Okay? That's possible. But I'm going to say to you, and you'll see it in the foyer, 85% certainty to me that Trump will not let the dollar go up. That is the last thing President Trump wants. Okay, now, we had a report on, on Friday about, you know, manipulation of uh, foreign uh, countries. It's a semi-annual treasury report, and Trump follows up with tweets on Sunday. Ah, China and Russia, however, are manipulating currency. And, of course, immediately on, mo on Monday, the, mark, the dollar sells off. Okay, that's how she's going to go. Okay, what does all this add up to? And I, I haven't really given you all the bullish and bearish because I wanted to talk about some other things. But this is our current forecast. It's only slightly modified from the forecast at year end. Scenario A basically says that 15% says, I am out to lunch. Okay, we build a scenario that, that assumes everything that I just said is not true. Okay. The dollar is going up, real interest rates are going to be quite positive, and so forth. That's the kind of price you'd expect to see over time, a $1,200 price drifting under $1,200. B, pretty middle of the road, okay? In line with what we think will happen to the dollar. The dollar will weaken somewhat, inter real interest rates will stay around zero, they won't get too high or anything, because inflation will pick up a little bit. And so we're looking at, let's say, a 2019 average of 1,415. Okay, you know, it doesn't shoot the lights out, but that's kind of what the models are telling us. And C, the dollar takes a dive, and you get some other issues coming into play. Now we're talking about a more interesting gold price. And then I say, okay, but you know, there's no way in a model that you can incorporate geopolitical crises. Now, I added in 12 to $20. Now you say, well, that's pretty low, right? I mean, gold can go up $100. But understand that in a crisis, gold goes up $100. But within a month, it's probably back down to where it was. So you've got to average all that out. 
So I've added some factor. I don't know if these are reasonable factors, but I've added some factors in. And so what I, what I, I, would, I would say to um, uh, both Sean's and, 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 and the companies here, uh, if you think in terms of a 1400 to 1450 price for next year, I think that's a good price to plan around. Okay? It is a probability-weighted price projection. Okay, in there obviously is a price less than 1200, but the probability of that is very low. And that says the same thing. So let me thank you for being a very patient audience. And uh, I have another deck of slides that I'd be pleased to. Um, <laughs> for another um, one. But um, maybe we'll <laughs> leave it at this. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah.